Go to the description to vote on who gets covered for next month's dive, and also check out the Spotify playlist with all the songs from this video and more. Thanks and enjoy. Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. I wonder if the Bible says anything about this. Well, I know the inner circuitry of a loudspeaker now, but I still don't know what all this burning bush business is about. Though, strangely enough, I'm now suddenly inspired to check out an artist that I've wanted to cover ever since I started this series. Today, we're talking about Kate Bush. Let's dive in. Catherine Bush was born in late 1950s England. Coming from a fairly artistic family, she began playing piano and writing songs at age 11. Eventually, she recorded a demo tape, and that tape got in front of David Gilmour, guitarist for Pink Floyd. Through his connections, she was signed to EMI in the mid-70s, though she wouldn't put out a full album for a few more years. During this interim, Kate got her roster of songs up to approximately 200. She also signed up for dancing classes with Lindsay Kemp, a famed choreographer and interpreter dancer most known for working with David Bowie. By late 1977, she had begun work on her first album. That album was The Kick Inside, released in February 1978. And as you're hearing this, and looking at this, you might be thinking, Ah, so that's when the acid's supposed to kick in. It's about time you learned the hard facts of life, and one of them is that Kate Bush's entire presentation is very singular. There's an intrinsic sense of motion in her music, especially her melodies, and especially her dancing. Apparently she was inspired by philosopher George Gurdjieff's Fourth Way, the psychological mindset that believes mind and body are creatively linked. Of course, it also helped that even as a 19-year-old, Kate Bush was a darn good songwriter. Take, for example, the album album's biggest hit, Wuthering Heights. There's so much motion in this song, there's two music videos to fit it all. It's a wonderful piece of melodrama, and to be clear, I don't mean that in a negative or sarcastic way. The way Kate uses instrumentation and key changes at such a young age is sensational, and it's that craft that made Kate the first woman to have a self-written song top the UK charts. Also, even though it's based on the book of the same name, it sounds like the opening theme to an 80s sitcom. The Man with the Child in His Eyes is a remarkably mature love song written by someone who couldn't rent a car yet in the UK. Them heavy people at first seems like it'll be Kate's short people, but it's actually about religion and wanting to learn as much as possible at a young age. The album does lose a bit of momentum towards the end, but still, as a first impression, major props need to be given. Kate Bush really put her best foot forward. The Kick Inside was a real kicker in the UK and a mild toe tap in the US. But seeing the success that Kate's first album had, EMI did what any parent would do to their 19-year-old teen, force them to do something they don't want to do. EMI pushed hard for Kate to capitalize on her newfound success by releasing a follow-up. To compound the issue, Kate also had to use session musicians instead of her own Katie Bush band. Kate's second album, Lionheart, was released just a few months after the first, in November of 78. Because of the speed at which she had to make this one, there are only three songs on here that were written specifically for this album. The rest were from Kate's back catalog. Plus, many of these songs revolve around the same production and instrumentation as Kick Inside, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. In fact, while Andrew Powell returned to produce this album, Kate did assist with production, a role that she would grow into more on future albums. And even with the rushed schedule, there are still good songs on this. I think Symphony in Blue is just as good an opener as the Kick Inside's moving. I also think Hammer Horror is a better closer than the Kick Inside's title track. There's something about the guttural way Kate sings the chorus that makes it both catchy and a little bit terrifying. And who could forget hit single, Wow. No, really, how could you forget it? But again, considering how soon this came after her first album, Lionheart definitely feels like the Kick Inside 2. It's not bad, it's just nothing new. If you thought Kate would get to slow down after putting out two albums in a year... <laughs> in April of 79, Kate kicked off the Tour of Life, 
the only concert tour she's ever done. It incorporated a narrative through line, miming, magicians, burlesque, visual effects. It was so extra that they basically invented the wireless mic headset for this tour, and that's pretty much a footnote in the grand scheme of this tour. The tour was a critical and commercial success, but it also drained Kate to the bone. If there's one bright spot to be found though, the resulting live EP allowed Kate to act as co-producer, which convinced EMI that she could handle production along with collaborator John Kelly for her next album. And as such, Never Forever, released in September 1980, is noteworthy for marking the beginning of Kate opening up her sonic palette, like a dentist cleaning your teeth. And what do dentists always use when they open your mouth? A Fairlight CMI synthesizer. She had learned about it while working on Peter Gabriel's Melt, and she was drawn to the newfound sonic possibilities that it offered. Also, fun fact, Phil Collins also worked on Melt, and it was there where he and Kate learned about gated reverb, which he would later implement on In the Air Tonight. And I'm not just talking about throwing a synth part on every chorus. The Fairlight and other digital instruments allowed Kate to construct not just new sounds, but new soundscapes. The breaking glass on Babushka, the gun handling noises on Army Dreamers, a Koto on All We Ever Look For. Kate and her team relished the opportunity to use the studio, Abby Road in this case, as an instrument. Thankfully, the songs also work as songs, and along with the studio experimentation, Kate also started weaving narratives into her music. Blow Away is a tribute to her lighting director who died in a freak accident during the tour of life. Egypt is a full-fledged, tourism-inspired mental descent. The Wedding List is a harmonica soloing revenge fantasy, and Breathing is a dystopian doomsday vision with the most terrifying vocal performance Kate Bush had done up to this point. The album opener and its biggest hit, Babushka is based on the English folk song, Sauvé. In that song, a woman dresses up as a highwayman to trick her lover. In Babushka, the narrator impersonates a younger woman to trick her husband, leading to her marriage being left in shambles. In other words, it's the closest thing we have to Kate Bush's Pina Colada song. And its music video is... <laughs> Taken as a whole, Never Forever helps us link early Kate Bush to the albums that would follow. So while it's not an album that I would breathlessly recommend, it's worth recognizing this as the turning point for Kate Bush as an artist. While not a flat-out critical smash, Never Forever did make history as the first number one album by a female British solo artist in the UK. And it did inspire Kate to take that full-fledged leap into production. So what does an album fully produced by Kate Bush look like? Welp. The Dreaming was released in September 1982, an album that startled most critics and listeners at the time, but has seen a reapproval as one of the most crucial albums in Kate Bush's discography. Boy, wouldn't it be funny if I just didn't click with this one on first listen? Like, could you imagine? It's a bold and uncompromising vision, but I will focus on that word uncompromising. I think I get the tepid reaction at the time because this album refuses to meet you halfway. It feels like Kate and her team looked at breathing from the last album and said, let's make an entire album like this. To some people, that's gonna be super cool. To others, uh... The title track is Kate's retelling of Aboriginal Australians being pushed out of their homeland by white settlers, complete with didgeridoo and Kate doing an Australian accent. This was the second single. Suspended in Gaffa details the fleeting experience of seeing God while being held back by gaff tape. Any audio engineer's worst nightmare. Night of the Swallow talks about a smuggler being begged by their lover to not go on their next job, alternating between light piano and bagpipes. This will be a theme going forward. Kate Bush really loved Celtic music. If you're willing to go that extra mile though and meet the album where it is, you will be rewarded with one of the most intricately produced records of its time. The hazy synths contrasting the syncopated horns on There Goes a Tenor, the passing cars and screams of I Love Life on Pull Out the Pin, the thundering drums on Leave It Open and Get Out of My House. From a sonic standpoint, this is certainly the most remarkable thing Kate had done up to this point. If it's good in big boy's eyes, then it's good in mine. The Dreaming is, as Kate would say later on, her She's Gone Mad album. It's the most excessive thing she's made so far, and everything she'll go on to make, at least for the next 10 years or so, will be more accessible versions of this. So if you do click with this on first listen, you're gonna adore what comes next. 
The only thing the Dreaming wasn't excessive in was sales. While it's thought of more positively today, critics and the public at the time weren't really feeling the Dreaming. It doesn't help that the album just exhausted Kate to the point where she was diagnosed with nervous exhaustion after it released. So as Kate prepped for the next album a few years later, she found herself facing more resistance and doubt than ever before. To help ease the pressure, Kate built a full studio in a barn behind her parents' farm. That sounds pretty barn good! Having the countryside as her home allowed her the freedom and time to work and try new things. For example, she started learning ballet from famed choreographer Diane Gray. The culmination of her work was Hounds of Love, released in September 1985. Man, wouldn't it be funny if I didn't click with this? Nah, I'm not gonna do that to you. This album's outstanding. The first thing to recognize about Hounds of Love, aside from it good, is the fact that it's technically two albums. The first half, Hounds of Love, is the most pop-leaning collection of songs Kate's made since probably her first album, and everything slaps. I cannot think of a better way to kick off this album than Running Up That Hill, A Deal With God, one of the most perfect songs Kate Bush has ever written. The original title was just Deal With God, but she had to change it because radio stations wouldn't play a song that had that word in it. With. The title track and the big sky are these massive anthemic songs with cavernous drums and outros that you can't help but sing along to. Cloud busting just oozes beauty and optimism. There's no way this song could be any better. Except for this. <laughs> The second half of the album, however, is something else. It's a full-on conceptual piece called The Ninth Wave, based on the poem The Idols of the King. Kate herself said she considered it a film more than a set of songs, telling the story of a woman drowning, her emotions and imagination running wild, and the eventual rescue. The atmospheric, anxious soundscapes of Under Ice and Waking the Witch set the stakes, but the life-affirming trio of Jig of Life, Hello Earth, and The Morning Fog make for one heck of a cathartic release. It is an absolute beast of a song cycle, and it's a large reason as to why this album has stood the test of time. This was the album that proved Kate Bush could be anything she wanted, and it's a glory to hear. Hounds of Love was Kate's most critically and commercially successful project in years. Plus, she had a hit in the UK with Peter Gabriel on Don't Give Up, as well as Experiment 4, which was recorded to promote her first Greatest Hits compilation. It was a Kate time to be Great Bush. Wait, that's not right. When she got back into the studio, she planned for her next album to be less conceptual and be more of a series of vignettes. The Sensual World was released in October 1989. And to quote Kate herself, the mischievous part of me wants to say that I enjoyed this one more than Hounds of Love, but there's a reason why that part of me is kept in the dungeon. In interviews leading up to Sensual World's release, Kate Bush spoke often about positive female energy and coming to terms with who you are as an adult. It's that kind of confident spirit that just pours out of the Sensual World. The title track is a phenomenal way to kick things off, with its pulsating drums and bagpipe hook. Apparently for lyrics, Kate wanted to use part of James Joyce's Ulysses, but the Joyce estate turned her down. For now. I cannot tell you how much I love Love and Anger. A banger, bop, and jam all rolled into one. Every second is excellence, from the opening drums to the closing yeah from Kate as she throws confetti, even if it did startle Sufjan Stevens. Kate Bush was mean when she startled me. She threw the party debris at me. Why? Okay, I gotta take a breather for a second. Let me just put on Rocket's Tail for Rocket with these haunting harmonies. I sure hope a kick-ass guitar solo doesn't come in. Once again, Kate also gets to hone her storytelling skills. Deeper understanding has the narrator becoming obsessed with their computer, shutting out the outside world in the process. Heads Were Dancing shows the narrator out at night dancing with a stranger, only to realize the next day that he was Adolf Hitler. Boy. If I had a nickel. And closing this album out is one of Kate Bush's most enduring hits, This Woman's Work. The song was written for a John Hughes movie called She's Having a Baby. It reflects the scene in said movie where Kevin Bacon realizes that he has to grow up to properly father this child. As the kids say, Kate understood the assignment. It's a gorgeous piece of music and a perfect way to close out the album. The song has been covered countless times in the years since, the most well-known one being Maxwell's cover, which is also quite good. If The Dreaming is best as a work that unfurls and reveals more as time goes on, and Hounds of Love is the best mix of immediacy and depth, the 
Sensual World is the most instantly gratifying album she's put out this decade. And if I wanted to be a little chaotic cat, I'd call this my favorite album of hers up to this point. But again, Dungeon. The most noteworthy thing Kate released between Sensual World and the next album was a cover of Rocket Man for an Elton John covers album. Now before I play a clip of it, I want you to just take a second and imagine in your head what you think this cover sounds like. Based on all the clips I've played so far of Kate Bush's work, based on if you've heard the original Rocket Man, just form that mental image in your head. Maybe leave a comment saying what you think this cover sounds like. Okay, cool. Here's what the cover sounds like. Sorry, when I made my Kate Bush bingo card, I did not put down cruise ship ukulele reggae cover of Rocket Man with a bagpipe solo. I love it. As Kate began work on the Sensual World's follow-up, her game plan was to make a record that could be performed live, meaning less studio trickery and more full band production. The tour unfortunately never came to be, but the record did. The Red Shoes was released in November 1993. Weirdly enough, despite being released in the 90s, the Red Shoes might be the most 80 sounding album Kate has made so far. Opener Rubber Band Girl is most emblematic of that. While I do like the song, it does give me low-key horror flashbacks to David Bowie's Never let me down and its world-consuming snare drum. From there, the tone of the album can veer wildly. A jaunty bop like Eat the Music is immediately followed by Moments of Pleasure, a sweeping ballad dedicated to those who Kate had lost over the past few years. The last minute or so where she specifically calls to them by name was really affecting. What I'm gonna say next might sound like I'm memeing, but I swear I'm being honest. Lily sounds like Playboy Cardi's Metamorphosis. At least these background synths do. Top of the City is probably my favorite song on the whole record. Just listen to this bass line. Ah, so sick. Constellation of the Heart sounds like Kate Bush's take on Prince, which is funny because Prince is on this album, but not on that song. There's actually a number of high profile guests on here. Prince, Eric Clapton, and Jeff Beck are all on here in some capacity. I really enjoyed the Red Shoes as a whole, which surprised me because many in the discourse see this as one of her lesser albums. I personally enjoyed the more human and lively feel that Kate and co were going for. That said, the album can feel... I don't know if scattered's the right word. It, it can feel like its nerves are fried. Like the musicians have been pushing ahead so far for so long and could fall apart at any moment. I mean, maybe this is reading too much into it, but the album is named after a grim fairy tale where a girl is forced to dance after putting on red shoes to the point where she cuts off her own feet and yet they keep dancing. It, it's not subtle, that's all I'm gonna say. And in fact, Kate Bush did take a break after the Red Shoes and the Line, the Cross, and the Curve. Oh god, I forgot about the Line, the Cross, and the Curve. Basically, it was a 50-minute short film featuring songs from the Red Shoes. The story was a retelling of that grim fairy tale. Kate would later go on to call it a load of bollocks. But anyway, yes, she took a break. The album had drained her, and she had lost some very close people. I mentioned those she had named on Moments of Pleasure, but during the album's making, her mother passed away as well. It would be another 12 years before Kate would release a new album. Her hiatus was very, very quiet. The biggest event of note was the birth of her son Bertie in 1998. She also recorded a cover of George Gershwin's The Man I Love, which sounds outstanding. It reminds me of when Bjork did a cover of Oh It's So Quiet, these outlandish artists showing their chops with more old-school fare, I, I love it. Otherwise, yeah, all was quiet with Kate Bush for over a decade. And then... Seemingly out of nowhere, Kate Bush released King of the Mountain as a single, and soon thereafter, Ariel was released in November 2005. How do you follow up on 12 years worth of hype? Well, the short answer is you kinda don't. Ariel is similar to Hounds of Love in that it's split up into two distinct halves, a sea of honey and a sky of honey. Honey no matter where you look. Ariel is also similar to Hounds in that the first half is the more accessible, disjointed side, and the second is the full-on conceptual art piece. However, I don't think the difference is as stark between the two sides as it was on Hounds. You see, for most of its runtime, Ariel just kind of exists. The second half especially, A Sky of Honey is a sonic recreation of the natural world, to the point where one song is mostly bird song. Ariel doesn't seek to wow and amaze like the past few records, instead it crafts the world in immense detail and invites you in, 
But no worries if you don't come in. Kate's not worried. She's Kate freaking Bush. She can do whatever she wants. She could recite the digits in pi for a whole song, and it would be gorgeous. Three, three, two, three, two, oh, did you think I was joking? Of course, there are still moments that will catch your ear. The flamenco influence on Sunset, the immediate hooks on King of the Mountain and How to Be Invisible, the ballads dedicated to her son and her mom, and to reiterate, the sound of the album is immaculately produced. But with all that said, I'm not tripping over myself to recommend this like I did with Sensual World and even Red Shoes to some extent. To me, Kate Bush made the album she wanted to make, and even though it's not my personal favorite, I look forward to revisiting it at some point down the line. Speaking of revisiting... Early in 2011, it was revealed that Kate would be releasing a revisited collection of older songs, Director's Cut, which came out later in May of that same year. So a bit of background for this. The Sensual World and the Red Shoes had been recorded with digital equipment, and in the years after their release, Kate had stated that she wasn't a huge fan of either album's sound. This new project, however, would be recorded with analog equipment, and she hoped it would give these songs a warmer feel closer to what she had originally intended. But lest ye think this is merely a simple covers album, don't ye think that. It's it's more. Every song on the track list has seen some kind of change. Sometimes it's lyrical, like how the sensual world is on here as Flower of the Mountain, with the lyrics from Joyce's Ulysses now added in. Sometimes it's a key change, like On Top of the City, which makes sense. I mean, these songs were originally recorded when Kate was about 20 years younger. Sometimes it's a reimagining. This new version of Rubber Band Girl sounds like if Kate had been a part of Steppenwolf. Sometimes it's a full deconstruction, like how this woman's work now sits somewhere between pop ballad and ambient atmospherics. Personally though, I'm not a huge fan of every change. As an example, on this version of Deeper Understanding, in place of the chorus harmonies, Kate uses a robotic voice. It's a change that makes more sense given the song's subject matter, but to me, something's kind of lost when it's just one voice. All of this is to say, it's often fun to hear Kate and Co. revamping and remixing these older songs, but I don't think the album as a singular piece holds up unless you've already heard the original songs. I've seen people disparage this album, and I don't think the dismissal is entirely fair, but that's also because I don't really think this should be considered a mainline album of hers, especially since we'd be getting a new album of original material the same year. While some were disappointed that Director's Cut was, in their eyes, just a covers album, their disappointment was assuaged once they learned that we'd be getting another, entirely new Kate Bush album in just a few months. 50 Words for Snow was released in November 2011. Even over 30 years since her debut, Kate manages to surprise. For example, the voice of a young child is the first you hear on opener Snowflake, as he plays the part of a snowflake falling to the ground. The duet between this boy and Kate is all the more harrowing when you learn that the boy is Kate's son, Bertie who by the way is a beautiful voice. Accompanied by the likes of her son, Elton John, Stephen Fry, and Steve Gadd on drums, Kate crafts something that is unlike pretty much anything in her discography. The most conventional song is lead single Wild Man, in which the narrator disguises the footprints of a yeti in the Himalayas to keep others from hunting them. The back-to-back -back pair of Lake Tahoe and Misty are the two longest songs Kate has ever released. The former focuses on a ghostly woman rising from a lake, the latter depicts a woman having a one-night stand with a snowman. Boy, if I had a nickel. The longer songs, the sparse instrumentation, and especially Kate's piano playing, beautifully evoke that barren, quiet, snowy landscape. It's an album that leaves enough space for you to sit with it and fill in the spaces yourself. I thought this one was tremendous. And though I don't think you should check it out until you have other Kate Bush albums under your belt, you're in for a treat once you get to it. The biggest thing Kate Bush has done since 2011 is her 2014 residency in London. A full concert featuring the Ninth Wave, A Sky of Honey, and a couple extra songs. An album from the show was released in 2016, and it's a spectacle to hear these longer, conceptual pieces heard live. Worth checking out once you've gotten through the main albums. Aside from that, Kate released a book of lyrics called How To Be Invisible. She released several remasters of past albums in 2018. That's been it. A lot of people have been hoping for a new album from her, and after this dive, I do too to some extent. But I mean, 
these 10 albums are so packed with detail and care, I'm gonna be finding new things to discover in them well after this dive. If working on this dive has taught me anything, it's that Kate Bush should not be rushed. And if she's gonna release new music, then she'll release new music. And if you wanna get into Kate Bush, definitely check out Hounds of Love to start. And then from there, I'd say The Kick Inside, The Sensual World, and probably Red Shoes. I'd also recommend The Dreaming and 50 Words for Snow, but not as the first records you check out. Definitely get through that first batch of albums before checking those ones out. And if you have a favorite Kate Bush song, album, music video, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. Coming up later tonight, a new episode of Wuthering Heights with guest star Carrot Top. Up next, the recommended videos tab.